Well, everyone, I'm really pleased to introduce my good friend, uh, Deputy Police, former Deputy Police Chief for the LAPD, and uh, one of the greatest guys that I know, Stephen Downey. How are you today, Stephen? I'm good, Steve. How are you doing? So the Al Capone era um, ended with the ending of prohibition. As you know, Al Capone went to jail for, for tax evasion. And when he went to jail for tax evasion, the violence of the prohibition era didn't stop. The violence of the prohibition era stopped when we ended prohibition. So the violence of the drug prohibition era, which has gone on for far too long and has become really a part of the industrial military complex, or the military industrial complex, the prison industrial complex, the drug treatment industrial complex, we have made systemic what was called corruption during the time of alcohol prohibition. The difference is, is that during alcohol prohibition, the corruption was bags of cash being carried in little brown bags and handed over to the judges and the police and all of those people who were corrupted by, by, the, by organized crime. In the case of 40 years of drug prohibition in this country, the corruption has become systemic. It's been made legal. So the federal government is basically buying off local law enforcement with grants and subsidies and asset seizure sharing and uh, militarization equipment from the military. And we have seen a transformation of what I call peace officer policing uh, into what today we see as drug warriors and the militarization of our police officers across this country and the addiction of our police departments and city officials to federal drug money. So this is what has to be reversed. The fact is, is that addiction in this country, it was about 1.3% uh, of the population when we passed the Harrison Act in 100 years ago. It was about 1.3% of the population when Nixon announced the war on drugs. It was 1.3% of the population when Reagan pumped up the war on drugs by putting in billions more. And today it's right around 1.3% of the population. So uh, drug addiction, uh, finally Obama has said that drug addiction is a health and education problem. Well, I know of no other health and education problem that's handed to the criminal justice system. So what we need to do in this country is hand the addiction and the abuse of drugs to the health and education institutions in our society. And we need to regulate and control, and in some cases tax, uh, uh, drugs. We need to put the marketplace for drugs into the hands of government regulation rather than into the hands of the cartels and street gangs. Because in that 40 years, those two little street gangs are now 33,000 street gangs across America, not just in Los Angeles. The membership is 1,500,000. And the cartels back in 72 who were barely heard of, they were a shadow somewhere in Latin America, now control 1,000 American uh, drug uh, distribution in 1,000 American cities. So it's a complete failure. And these are the things that I learned by being there. Now, 
what has been your uh, take on the pronouncements by the Attorney General Holder, uh, uh, pronouncements that have no legal standing, uh, and pronouncements which are hedged in a very guarded language, uh, I, I didn't really see much to get excited about. Maybe I missed something. What, what did you see? Well, I thought I saw it as symbolic, uh, and if if the uh, DOJ puts into practice this policy that's announced by Holder across the United States and and every U.S. attorney in every region across the United States honors that policy, I see, uh, I see a beginning of being able to prove that this drug war uh, has been um, folly. Uh, however, I agree with you, all it is is symbolic and all it is is the policy and the next guy in can change that policy. What we need to change is the law. We need to eliminate Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act and, and eliminate prohibition. We need to stop this nonsense of, of uh, banning things, this nonsense of creating policies that they, that they uh, refer to as zero tolerance. Zero tolerance when... I well, hold on. I want to get back to Holder, if I may. Right. Because it seems that Holder and Obama are ignoring sick, disabled, and dying people that need cannabis and are being denied that through various, a whole litany of actions being taken by the federal court. And I would have thought that the first thing, the most important thing for Holder to address when he made those statements is the recognition the, that people have the right to uh, uh, vote as a state and allow sick, disabled, and dying people to have access to this medicine. And instead, what we got was a uh, in, a, a, a congratulations and a salute by Holder to U.S. Attorney Melinda Hagg, who has gone after some of the most reputable and uh, respected dispensaries that we have in this country, in, in this state. Well, that's why I said that <clears throat> if the U.S. attorneys in the various regions followed uh, the but letter. That, that is, that is and, it but seems she has to, not done that. Do, no. do they even care what Obama and Holder say or do? Well, uh, Melinda Haig uh, said that everything that she has in progress right now fits what Holder announced, but it's clearly, it doesn't fit. And it's clear that Melinda Haig is a prohibitionist, and it's clear that Obama has bigger fish to fry, and it's clear that Holder is basically an incompetent attorney general. And what is most clear to me is that these guys are married to the concept of the federal government operating at a level other than what was intended by the Founding Fathers. See, they think all solutions for society come from the federal government. And that's why Holder isn't saying get rid of the uh, Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act. What Holder is saying is, okay, I see a little movement out there in the states, and I don't want to create a constitutional crisis but I do think that it's very important for us here in the federal government to regulate everything that goes on in this country. And therefore, we're telling you now, the states, that if you do it our way, which they're bending their way, 
uh, uh, because they see this coming, but they still want to hang on to their power. If you do it our way, we'll leave you alone. Well, what I say, you got to go back and look at our Constitution. Go back and look at the prohibition of alcohol. How did we outlaw alcohol in this country? We did it by amending the Constitution. And when we ended it, we amended the Constitution again. Well, the reason we did that is because our Constitution says that the federal government can't pass laws like the prohibition of alcohol. So now the question is, how does the federal government pass the Controlled Substances Act without a amendment to the Constitution? I actually can't have an do answer that. for that. You can't do that, but no. our but no, our here's what here's what they would argue. <coughs> they would argue that the United States signed a treaty that they designed and wrote, but the United States signed a treaty with uh, dozens of other countries the Psychotropic uh, Treaty of 1962, I believe it was. And they then ran back to the Congress and they said, gee, we signed this treaty and it's got all these schedules and everything, and the full faith and credit of the United States is on the line here. We have to adopt this treaty and adopt these schedules. Well, you know, I, I know that's what they said. It but, doesn't make uh, it right or it, constitutional. It, it, it doesn't change the constitution. No, the constitution, it doesn't. if you want to, if you want to in, enter into a treaty that is going to impose laws on the states that are not provided by the constitution, then what you need to do is amend the constitution. That's exactly. And so right. uh, they didn't do that with a Controlled Substances Act, and then the Reich decision came along on marijuana later on. And the Supreme Court, uh, well, I guess Congress uh, initially uh, said that uh, uh, they had this power through the uh, Commerce Clause because if a, if a seed growing from a marijuana field blows across the border, then uh, state commerce uh, is involved or, or however they made up that silly argument. You know, uh, I, I had it out with Robert Rach, a friend of mine, and I said, Rob, why didn't you point out that Wickert, the uh, farmer that this case refers to, why didn't you point out that he had signed a contract with the United States and was then caught growing extra wheat? Right. And it was because he had signed a contract and entered into a legal relationship with the United States that they were able to take him to court and argue that they had jurisdiction. Right. And Rob did not even bring that up, unfortunately. Well, uh, <laughs> that is unfortunate. I, I, hopefully, that's going to be undone. I, uh, it's the same thing with farm subsidies today. I mean, we grow wheat, and and we pay people for not growing wheat, and if they violate that, then they're break contract with the federal government. That's a lot different than the Congress passing the law that says you can't grow wheat in California. You can't grow hemp in California. It's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a corruption of our Constitution. Now let me ask you about this new bill that passed and became law in California. Uh, that Jerry Brown has signed it. And that law nullifies federal law and says that uh, the uh, detention of suspects, uh, uh, indefinite detention, is not legal in, the, in California. And California authorities will not cooperate with any effort to undertake an indefinite detention. Were you aware that that law passed? Uh, are you speaking of the immigration law? No. No, it's it's the law that specifically nullifies the federal law uh, for indefinite detention. And the fact that you're not aware of it just shows me how incompetent the media is because they largely ignored that. I'll send you that separately and well, uh, cut that out of our interview. Well, uh, I know that Jerry Brown recently 
signed legislation <clears throat> that has to do with uh, local law enforcement uh, holding uh, for immigration purposes people that are arrested uh, on minor charges. And uh, that law says that we are no longer going to service the immigration people by by putting immigration holds on people for certain classes of crime. What a lot of people don't understand, and this is, in my opinion, one of the, um, one of the biggest problems in this country. We have a Federalist Constitution that says the federal government can't do certain things and that everything is residual to the states. Take education, for example. So the federal government wants to get its oar in the education waters in this country, and they create a Department of Education. Now, they still can't tell us how to educate our children, but what they can do is they can tax us and take our money and then say to us, if you do it our way, we'll give you money. If you don't do it our way, we won't. This is happening in California right now with this core uh, nonsense that the Department of Education has invented. California, much more advanced than the ideas that come out of the uh, defunct halls of, of Congress and the Department of Education, they say they are now telling us in California you're not going to get the money. And we're put in the position of having to close schools because they take our money and then they don't give it back. Well, it's the same thing with the drug war. They give us money. We become so addicted to that money. Now we have organizations like the California Chiefs of Police and the California Narcotics Officers Association so addicted to that money they will do anything to fight the status quo. They will oppose everything that has to do with easing up on mandatory minimum sentences, easing up on three strikes, easing up on medical marijuana laws. We're trying to fix, right now in California, we're trying to fix... Well, ho hold on. Let me just ask you. Are you saying that if the federal funds dried up, that police would not have this prohibitionist attitude they wouldn't be fighting us every step of the way like they are i i am saying that i am saying that the police culture the organizations that represent police culture and the people that the power the power of money wants to maintain the status quo and and i am saying that if that money was taken away that power would go with it, and their arguments and their ability, their ability to argue and to manipulate our system would be different. Let me give you a tiny example. We have in the state of California, and I am in the process of, of dealing uh, uh, with this issue right now, with a state entity called Peace Officer Standards and Training, POST. POST was created to, to ensure that there was a minimum standard of training for police officers in California. It was, it was, uh, it was uh, <clears throat> a really breakthrough kind of stuff when it was created. And the first thing was for basic graduation from any police academy you needed a certain level of training. Well, it's grown over the years. And so they have all kinds of courses that are post-certified. Okay, so now 16 years ago, you were involved with the passage of Proposition 19. One of the first things that happened after Proposition 19 was passed is the Attorney General in California. I think you're mean Prop 215. 215. What did I say? 19. No, no, 19 was a little more recent. No, 215. The Attorney General, uh, Lundgren, he ran out. He got all the chiefs of police and the Narcotic Officers Association to oppose 
in everywhere they could the implementation of 215 rather than recognize the will of the people, rather than recognize their oath of office to the California Constitution and California law and the will of people, to oppose it. Well, one of the things that happened is over those years is that the California Narcotics Officers Association received certification from Peace Officers and uh, Standards and Training, which is a state entity, they received certification to teach all kinds of narcotic enforcement courses, one of which is medical marijuana dispensaries. And I have uncovered that much of what they teach is contrary to what the law says. And they teach people how to go out and interrogate patients to prove that they're not really patients, which is, which is total silliness. But they're teaching that stuff. Now, as they teach this stuff, police departments all over the state send their people, their peace officers, to these CNOA classes to get this misinformation, to be exposed to biased education on what 215 really is. They charge for it, so taxpayer money goes to the California Narcotics Officers Association, that money becomes fungible, and then this outfit, the California Narcotics Officers Association, has a full-time lobbyist in Sacramento by the name of John Laval, who lobbies to keep the status quo on all narcotic-related laws in California, who joins with the Chiefs of Police Association, the Corrections Officers Association, the Prison Builders Association. Now, how do you do that? Isn't that a violation of their practices? How does post certify courses and then not monitor those courses to see that they're accurate? And how does, how does POST enter into an agreement with an organization that lobbies the legislature using taxpayer money to do that lobbying? How well, does that are, happen? Those are all excellent questions. So thank you so much for joining us today. You got it, Steve. Nice talking to you.